don't know how Adam Schiff does that. He calls order to the to the Congress. Yeah, I need a gavel up here. I need a gavel up here. Denise, thanks for coming here. I've been eating peaches and peaches and peaches ever since your book came out. I think the nation is right now feasting in peaches, but um, so this evening we're here. Uh, it's it's a special evening at the Somerville uh, Library to have fun with. I was going to say to honor, but that sounded kind of stultified. To uh, to have fun with our poets laureate. Um, which we have three of them. And um, just a little background, we hear this term laureate. Well, if, you're, if you ever eat chili or spaghetti sauce or ragu or whatever, and, there, and you come up with a leaf in your mouth, likely as not, that serrated leaf is, is laurel. And that's, or bay, laurel. Um, and the laurel bush or bo laurel tree is actually where the word laureate comes from. Uh, it's from ancient Greece, they would make crowns or wreaths in laurel to put on. It would designate a great honor for a certain poet or for heroes. And don't let that amaze you. Poets are very heroic, menly, which they aren't. But <laughs> So uh, Laureate comes from that. And... Um, the guy that you might remember, Francis Petrarch, during the Renaissance, at the beginning of the Renaissance, it was actually a person a little before him, Albertino Musato. They revived this tradition of the poet laureate in Europe. We're talking around the 1300s, 1340, that area. They, they were trying to emulate or revive the classics, the Greeks and the Latins, wh whose poetry they were they were reviving the philosophy was coming back. We all remember what the Renaissance meant, right? And so they weren't certain about how it went, but that was the birth of the poet laureate. It became official with the Renaissance and ever since. So in the United States, the Library of Congress appointed a consultant in poetry to the Library, to the Library of Congress in 1937 to 1984. And in 1985, they changed that title to the Poet Laureate Consultant in Poetry to the Library of Congress, and thus uh, America brought the tradition here. Uh, in England, Poet Laureate is a lifetime appointment, which was one of the reasons Philip Larkin declined it. Um, and Ted Hughes was, Ted Hughes ended up with that. I, I know many, but I won't go through my Poet Laureate stories. <laughs> anyway, and then so, Today, most states and many local communities, towns, and cities have created poet laureate positions. Um, and the, the term has come to signify recognition for preeminence or superlative achievement. And I think that is very true for our three poets tonight. They are preeminent. And, um, and they also are wonderful promoters of the art. It's a new sense that instead of the community huddling around the Poet Laureate. The Poet Laureate goes out and finds his flock and says, this is what we have to remember about our humanity. And they bring great things to us like group readings and so forth. And I'm going to go over that. So how, just how the exalted and worthy office came to the town was a bit the, the dream and the drumming of Doug Holder. Uh, who's with us. He's just going to talk a little bit about how the, the position was created. And after that, I will uh, introduce our three poets. I won't keep you long. Um, Doug is the founder of the Ibbotson Street Press. He's an arts editor for the Somerville Times. His poetry and prose have appeared widely across the nation. He teaches uh, writing at Bunker Hill Community College and Endicott. And he has run workshops for psychiatric patients at uh, McLean Hospital for 30 years now. He taught Robert Lowell. No, he didn't. <laughs> I think Robert Lowell left Doug. Ro uh, Robert left Doug his notes. <laughs> uh, Doug's also the author of 11 books of poetry, including Wrestling with My Father, The Man in the Booth at the, Mid at the Midtown Tunnel, Eating Grief, 
and his most recent collection, Last Night at the Worst House, if everyone remembers the Worst House. And that's a German word. It doesn't mean the, the, the most awful place you can be, the Worst House. It's, it's, it means something else. It, that's what it is. The worst house is the best house. So, and that was published by Grace Barrel Press. Uh, he's also he also does for the Somerville Community Access TV scat, and they are filming us tonight. Um, writer to writer and poet to poet. And he interviews. Wow. And that's my cue then. So everyone, uh, welcome Doug. He's going to talk just a little bit about how Somerville came uh, to have a, a Poet Laureate. Doug? Oh, let's see here. Well, so I'll be brief, but I will tell you that uh, for years I was advocating uh, for a Poet Laureate. I wrote a column in the, my, my column in the Somerville Times about how this would be a truly great thing for Somerville. Uh, Somerville is, as we all know, a city of writers, right? There's many, I, I remember at one point, well, I have Bert Stern, who's a fine poet, lives right across from me, and then Afa Weaver lived right down the block, and Joe Tora lives right down the block, and Gloria Mindock lives, so it's, you know, you, can, you can't help but bumping into a poet or writer in Somerville. And Somerville has a certain sensibility like uh, no other city that I've lived in. And, it's, and one poet summed it up when he told me, uh, in Medford, when you see a guy on the street with a camera, you figure he's with an insurance company. In Somerville, well, he's an artist. <laughs> well, finally, about five years ago, I sat down at the old Sherman Cafe in Union Square with Greg Jenkins of the Somerville Arts Council. and. Harris Gardner of Tapestry of Voices, and we decided to go through with it, and the uh, mayor approved it, and um, he blessed the project, and, and the rest was history. A first poet laureate was uh, Nicole Therese Dutton. Um, she was great, and she sort of, you know, broke the new ground. And our second was Gloria Mendock, a longtime Somerville presence in the literary and theater scene, and of course, Lloyd Schwartz, everyone knows, Pulitzer Prize winning music critic, poet, um, teacher. So all of these are great poets that we had and also very community minded people. You know, you could be a great poet but be a real, you know, pain in the tuchus, you know. But um, these people are, you know, these people are, are very community minded and they, um, and they connect with the people. So this is what I envisioned years ago, and I was so glad this was birthed and has continued to bloom. Thank you. Thanks, Doug. This paper? Yes. I'm like Erwin Corey. Thanks, Doug. And so that's that's how that came to be. And Doug's Doug's a a great promoter of poetry in the area. So without uh, tearing too long, um, Nicole Therese Dutton is um, our first poet. She served as Somerville's uh, inaugural Poet Laureate. Her work has appeared in Callaloo, Pl Plowshares, 32 Poems, Indiana Review, and Salt Hill Journal, all very uh, esteemed. Nicole earned an MFA from Brown University and has received fellowships from the Frost Place, the Fine Arts Work Center, Breadloaf Writers Conference, and the Virginia Center for the Creative Arts. Her collection of poems, If One of Us Should Fall, was selected as winner of the 2011 Cave Canem Poetry Prize. About that collection, Patricia Smith wrote a very in, uh, inspired uh, comment of uh, this fierce and for formidable poetry debut throbs with restless beauty and a lyrical undercurrent that is both empowered and unpredictable. And uh, I believe uh, Major Jackson also noted uh, Nicole's, um, well, she, he, he said, all art song with a velocity of seeing that delights any reader's yearning for a new experience with language. So she keeps the reader on her toes 
on his toes where we need to be. Everyone, please welcome our Poet Laureate from 2015-2016, Nicole Therese Dutton. Thank you. Thanks for gathering us all here. And, um, and again, thank Thank you, Doug Holder, for making this happen and making this position and for Somerville being, for being the kind of place that's gonna celebrate poetry and hold it special. Um, that doesn't happen everywhere, you know. I wanna read, I wanna, I wanna start by reading a poem by Lucille Clifton. This is called Blessing the Boat. May the tide that is entering even now, the lip of our understanding, carry you out beyond the face of fear. May you kiss the wind, then turn from it, certain that it will love your back. May you open your eyes to water, water waving forever, and may you, in your innocence, sail through this to that. When I was, um. I was always writing poetry since I was a little kid writing poetry. My son writes poetry, I love poetry, but I never, it never occurred to me to write poetry and to share it and to be a part of a community and that I didn't, I was missing that piece. I loved poetry. And so I ended up going to Kaveh Kanem, um, which is a, it's a poetry organization to support black poets. And Lucille Clifton came through and, um, and she sat with us and was like, you know, she's an empress. And she was incredibly generous and incredibly kind. And one of the things, I know I've, I've said this before, but one of the things that she said that struck me and that I carry with me is she mentioned um, that she had three kids in diapers at the same time and that she wrote a poem every day. And we were like, what? Like, that's ridiculous. And we said, how did you do that? And she said, very simply, she said, I, I just wrote the poem that was there. Simple, right? This poem is called Redeployment, The Way, Become e the way We Become Each Other's Memory. Can you all hear me? Mm -hmm. Okay, good, thanks. Dear Lisa, some of the details are thin gruel, translucent bones and meat gone, but the job is mine. I wear your vowels like go-go wear, like rocket fuel, step into high tops, your cackle, your mouth, like mine tearing open a field of yowling poppies, ruckus and slather, a siege of grackle lifting from the corner of sky. I can be a tree that is not a tree, but a forest of slow breath, a tree that is a scaffold of seed and music. Some of the details may be smudged, shoehorned or badly translated. Some of the details will have a ham clap, clap track and will glide in on roller skates. And someday you and me with our heads tipped back on some country road edged with cows and goats will laugh. But for now, I have everything I need. I remember enough to tell it. We'll gladly reach into the winter cluster of the honeybees shivering around their queen. I'm from Cleveland, but I have a fondness for all of the, the Rust Belt cities. So this is a, a poem about Detroit, um, which has long been in decline, not unlike Cleveland. Um, but I read that in Detroit, there is a, you know, there's, there's so little infrastructure um, in some places that there's a situation where there's just dogs, like feral dogs all around and no, and darkened streets that are sort of untended to. Um, and this is, this is, a bit of a news item that I heard that I have transposed into a poem. Detroit in the year of cicadas. I am a name with small hands, just a notion moving past the picture windows, mostly silent, and the clouds within the bones of my chest crumble a little more each day. Since they cut the electric, the streets crowd with starved dogs. We stay inside, Boil rainwater gathered in mixing bowls on the sill for soup, turnip or parsnip, kale, anything that can root and survive. The police don't come, won't come. So when I hear her cry out, I enter her house through the side. He wants money, jewelry, some silver dollars holed up in a shoebox or wrapped in a velvet pouch beneath the floorboards. 
whatever he thinks silly old women like us keep in our dark bread boxes and unheated homes. I stand just beyond the sweat of him, the itch half hidden beneath his dungarees. No one pays attention to reliable, ordinary things, the well-oiled door, the cast iron skillet on the stove heavy enough for most purposes. When I bring it down against his head, he crumples like a marionette. Outside, the sky is the color of pears. Restless dogs shift on whittled limbs, and my voice, like the cicadas whose hard black bodies will for weeks rain from the trees, is suddenly everywhere. It stuns itself against the wainscoting, the wooden spoons, urgent and unsatisfied, touching everything it can. Oh, thank you. Appreciate that. This poem is called Magnitude and Bond. More than anything, I need this boy so close to my ears, his questions electric as honeybees in an acreage of goldenrod and aster. Time, where we are, is slow sugar in the veins of white pine, rubbery mushrooms cloistered at their feet. His tawny listening at the water's edge, shy antlers in pooling green light, fox prints etched in clay. I need more little black boys to be able to be little black boys. Whole saltwater galaxies in cotton and loudness, not fixed in stunned suspension. Episodes on hot asphalt, waiting in the dazzling absence of apology. I need this kid to stay mighty and cultish, thundering alongside other black kids. Their wrestle and whoop, the brightness of it. I need for the world to bear it. And until it will, may the trees kneel closer while we sit together in mineral hush. May the nearness grow roots and canopy, hold us soft as tender shoots against a windy distance. May the boy whose dark eyes are an echo of my father's dark eyes reach with cupped hands into the braided current. The boy, restless and lanky. The boy who has memorized the beetle's lacquered armor, each furrowed seed this delicate thread of water for the attention he pours into each heartbeat. The boy who once told me, the world gives you second chances. This boy tugging my arm saying, look, saying now. I have just two more poems. And this poem is a neighborhood poem. This is an Ohio neighborhood poem. I lived on one of those blocks where everybody lived on my block, and everybody was my friend, but I couldn't cross the street. So you knew everybody and all of their business. And so uh, this was a lot of the, the music and the noise and the, and the laughter that happened in Shaker Heights, Ohio, where I lived. Um, and these are all like supposed to be little vignettes. So they're a little bit all over the page. This is just a map of the neighborhood right here. Pooled street lights, voices, those bodies celestially leaned into shadows more than background, canvas after midnight burns. Music tagged original calligraphy, scarred floorboards of your heart, distance, time, the velocity of outgrown sneakers. Dredge our trove collective, spin it round the block. Good times, ours, was, fly papered and sugar daddied, Polaroids, hot clam fritters, milk teeth for money, and dirt bike jumping off. Our requisite grandmother visit, plastic covered couch, and last supper velvet wall hangings, limited edition installment planned commemorative plates. Holler at your boys, perfect as they are, hours before voices repel into bass and girls and the standard issue goodbye. Holler at your girls, jump ropes in a cornucopia of braids, Whole technicolor galaxies of plastic beads orbiting their faces, every cocoa buttered gaze opening like flowers. A Sunday people's pressed pants worn past into worn past worn into shine, overrun church shoes and laughing in the vestibule or picnic, corn in their teeth and a cob for you. 
report that bad behavior to mama, materialize at critical crosswalks, stare you down, chill, oceanic, what you doing? Broomy eyed gods of fierce love. Dig then, all the Bonnie Bell lip smacker cherry side winding, now and later's board and arrows cuff jeans and the trophy snap, you in a too big hand me down terry cloth short step, grinning, grinning. Your best friend, identically posed, squinting down the barrel of the lens, sore, mouthwise, from laughing and all day long tag and double double daring and no duh. It was a well earned moniker, Speedy, Shank, Bug, Twizzler, Wix, Baby Gab. So come on, wash your hands and fix yourself a plate. It's yours. And the last poem I want to read is called Gig. And this is a true story. Um, after having driven, I drove, we had this one series of, of gigs when I was in a funk band, and we drove across the country, and my bassist had carpal tunnel. And so we were driving from California to Massachusetts, and we were like, I feel like we were still in California, where he was like, I can't drive because of my arm. <laughs> we're far, far from home. Um, but then we ended up going to, to a town where an ex-girlfriend of his was. And then he was like, I can drive, I'm gonna drive. You know, I'm gonna drive up to her house because we're gonna go say hello and everything. So he drove that part. And then we, we, we got there and we didn't really know the situation. And, um, and she, she answered the door and her partner was there and everything. And, and it was a little bit of an embarrassment. So I've taken this situation in again, transposed it into you know my, my poems, needs. Gig, their lives are better without you. Look at the moon faces and raised champagne glasses in this photograph, the dismantled flowers on the church steps. He married last week, and the girl, when you meet her, is well ironed, kind. Good thing Austin is just one in a string of occasional places, and you, a girl with a Stratocaster growling mud and chrome into microphones, you can't stick around long. After the set, you will all be a litany of vectored facts, talking a scalloped edge around the sweet tea, six eyes parsing the, the differences between then and now, more creased, more safe, more of each of you. What is there to speak? You are alive within the memory of your own skin. You will be whatever creation you choose for the onstage hour, eyes moldering or not, heart lurching or not. Tomorrow is another town with contracts and cheese danishes. But tonight, play them a broom jump. Call it. Wear out. Be new. Thank you. That was wonderful, uh, Nicole. Nicole Datton, our first uh, poet laureate from Somerville. Gloria Mindock is the author of five books of poetry. Uh, most recently, I Wish Francisco Franco Would Love Me, uh, brought out by Nix's Mate Books uh, in 2018. Widely published in the USA, and abroad, her poetry has been translated into Romanian, Croatian, Serbian, Montenegrin, Spanish, Estonian, Albanian, and French. Gloria has been awarded the Ibbotson Street Press Lifetime Achievement Award, the Allen Ginsberg Award for Community Service by the Newton Writing and Publishing Center, and the 5th and 40th Moon Prize by Writing in a Woman's Voice. She was the Poet Laureate in Somerville, uh, 2017 to 2018. Uh, she has a chapbook, Oppositions, which is forthcoming from Yusoku Stampa from Montenegro. Um, high on the list of Gloria's involvement in poetry, she is the founding editor of Trevina Barva Press. In a recent interview with Erica Cheris Moling, for the Small Press Interview series, Gloria talked about the press's unique community outreach with events such as Pastry with Poets, 
uh, the poet of uh, the the portrait of an artist and poet readings. We see these up online all the time. Monologue Monday, Trevina Barva Press reading series, the Lost Bookshelf Bookstore. Uh, they sell new and used books, and I could go on and on. It's a it's a considerable outreach and it exemplifies. Uh, the mission of the laureate to raise awareness of poetry and to make opportunities for sharing poetry with one another. The curious thing is Gloria was doing all of this before her tenure as poet laureate and after, and she continues doing it now. So she's a great asset to the community, and it's great that she's here with us this evening. I'll introduce her, Gloria Mindock, everybody. Thank you, Michael, for the introduction, and Doug. And it's an honor, really, to read with Lloyd and Nicole. And I just want to say being Poet Laureate was so wonderful, and I met so many wonderful people in the community, so I will always carry that here. <laughs> so um, I think that we all have travel stories. Lloyd just shared one with me about being stuck on the plane in uh, Paris. And so this is my poem to the travel problems. <laughs> and I have to tell you, it's not a very nice poem. <laughs> it's called Exiled. What does it all mean, sitting at the bus station? People hurry, rudely pushing anyone they can out of the way, all for the moment added to get someplace quicker. Why doesn't the ground just open, swallow them up, clinch its dirty mouth on their skin, biting their eyes out of their sockets. It's the same way at the airport. Luggage knocks you over, people impatient, griping to anyone who will listen. Why doesn't the baggage carrier take them for a never-ending ride until their voice gets weak and they can't speak? Another place, the train station. No one wants to share a seat, Amtrak for the selfish. Why not put smelly, drunken people who'd never shut up next to them taking up most of the seat, pushing them over by the window, breath that is rusted, breathing into their face for eternity? This punishment is needed. Exile them face down into a pile of cockroaches. Maybe then they'll learn to put their palms over their mouth, watch their skin flush out from the sewer. You could tell I was in the mood at that, after that one. <laughs> um, um, this was part of uh, a project, the We Are You Project, and what it is artists, painters, and poets bring awareness of the Latinos and Latinas, um, awareness of them coming here and the trouble that they go through, um, learning our language and adjusting to the culture. Um, this is called Pieces. Her head full of stabbing pain, stress. Maria walked against time and felt doom in this new city. People rushing with eyes downward. No one noticed her or that she was lost. On the bus, the people were speaking and she didn't understand. Such a lonely feeling knowing she was going to make beds at a hotel. Maria felt like she was falling into hell just a nobody in a sphere, surrounded by objects, breaking, sharp, and cutting. I was in uh, a very slap happy mood when I wrote this next poem, and it's from I Wish Francisco Franco Would Love Me, and it's called The Fruit Fly. The fruit fly landed on Franco's nose and would not move. The skin was tasty. The fly started eating and eating until only bone was left. Francisco could no longer smell the slaughter. More fruit flies landed on his skin and chowed and chowed, bony man Franco disintegrating into all the fruit flies' mouths. Spain was liberated. Crow. Every summer, days last longer, making more killing easier. The crows cry. 
black feathers angry, their sound havoc as bullets scream past. Sick of this, I long for winter snow, burying the dead in ice a little longer, avoiding stench. There are weeping marches by the people that tumble the bodies over, frozen, transforming hospitals into vineyards to greet grief in a bottle. The birds stroll quickly, grabbing a worm before disappearing. Weapons show in the faces, eyes dark with murder, turn away. Gather yourself. Bullets are flying on this hot day, forcing skin to connect, tricking the bodies into ashes. Doesn't matter what country you are in, run from the dead who sleep to live. Uh, this is a new poem, and it's called Soldier. Flashes in the mountain, green with white, soon red, throat burning, thirst only a thought in the circled earth. The gunner shoots with a pump pumping force, a new reality hugging his heart. No time for weeping, no time for worry, no time for dying. No time for, no time, no. And another new one called Deeply. Helmet, dark eyes, dirty face, firing, fierce bullets, hitting too much skin. Landscape, buildings flat, sky gray, home is doomed. Bleeding war into the earth. Hands remember, mind searches. Silence hurts, ventures into loss. Past is now, footsteps red. The world sleeps, rest is tired. Sorrow heavy, sadness marches into some splendor only imagined. I am currently working on a manuscript um, called Ash, and everybody always tells me their problems when I'm out in the public. Doesn't matter where I am. Uh, I've heard so many bad relationship stories I can't even begin to tell you. And I worked for almost 40 years in addictions as a clinical director and um, case manager and happily retired. And um, I expected it from clients, but not the public, and it continues. So I am writing a manuscript about all these um, wonderful things they tell me. And I decided to take it a little step further and use like um, fire station, you know, fire hoses, anything having to do with fire. And that's why it's called ash. And this is called burned beyond recognition. Eyes of rescue turned out to be false. Who needs rescue? The thought of that makes me quietly go away from the doorway, running from any sonata you could play. The house became ash from the couch burning, the window shattering, and glass breaking into air. The fireman's foam, water putting the flames out that engulfed us. Long sentences burned my skin. No bandages helped. Wrap the gauze around your tongue. Choke until a different sound comes from your voice, an urgency of edges, sharp as the mirror shards you look into. Inhala inhalation, I can never say that word. <laughs> um, you'll see that happen a few times uh, with my reading. Smoke is everywhere. Down on the floor, I crawl. Where is it coming from? To be found out later. Once outside, a fireman helps me, gives me an oxygen mask. Breathe slowly, I'm told. As I lie there in an ambulance, I remember your words. They caused an explosion, this fire. Belongings are smoldering. It was so harsh, even a fire hose could not cool down the remains. All left uncovered exposed to the elements, frying. Light. 
Surrender to the dark night where the blackness empties into light. It is over between all the hearts that yearn. No street lights will guide those searching for a path. Stones have disintegrated, dirt as mud and weak legs cannot walk. Love is something that only convulses, empties the brain of reason, hear the sound from the throat. Scream to the black sky, the endless sky, the abyss, all else is prohibited. Give up, close your eyes, and beg for a light kiss. Keep your mouth closed. So this next one, I was in a silly mood again, so um, it's kind of warped. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> and it's called Baked. With a rolling pin in my hand, I roll your heart out flat. Stop it from beating. The redness of blood turns to wax, sticky while wet. I mix it with flour for consistency. Mind you, you never had this. Skin is added for extra flavor. After cutting up a few veins, my creation is ready to bake. Once out of the oven, all crisp, all beautiful, the door is opened and I throw it out for the birds. Peck away, my friends, eventually, all men get flown. And this next poem, the first three sections are true. The fourth section is made up. And the first three sections, uh, a client told me these. He's unfortunately dead now. Um, so it's OK to read these, of course. Um, but he had a way of telling things that, that just would make you double over all the time and and uh, so it, it's kind of sad and but anyway this is in honor of him <clears throat> excuse me plastic X was only s two months sober and was telling everyone he had a date despite being told to concentrate on his sobriety and not women he would not listen the next day he said they went out for dinner Afterwards, she invited him to her place for coffee. When they walked into her apartment, there were dolls sitting on the kitchen table, on the couch, in the bedroom, and even on the toilet. Doll eyes watching him, creepy. He left. We all teased him and said he should have kissed a doll. There would be no heart beating. All he would have to do is keep his lips closed. Then there would be no feeling. Two. X was sitting in the car with his date, about ready to go to dinner, when she said, wait, I have to wrap my head up in tinfoil. It is important for me to communicate with the aliens. Huh. X looked at her in disbelief. He took the tinfoil box from her and wrapped his head up with it, waiting for a miracle. Three, it has been a while since X went out on a date. He sat in the car with her as she smacked her gums and then stuck the chewing gum on the dashboard. Then she dug out her lipstick from her purse. X was still focusing on her gum on the dashboard. He looked around her car more closely and saw gum stuck all over the place. He felt a knot in his stomach and was disgusted. Got out of the car without saying a word. About a block later, as he was thinking, he reached in his pocket and unwrapped a piece of gum and chewed. Four, the sirens were going off. X knew it was time to get out. His heart was beating quickly. X was scared he would not make it. Heavy black smoke was filling the apartment up. He jumped and realized it was just a dream. Next to him was a woman, young and very pretty. His heart smoldered. He thought, what did I do to deserve such a thing? Just then, a fireman knocked down the door and resuscitated him. There was no girl, just a fire hose through the broken window. Sometimes, X, a flame is just a flame. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. And I'll close. Um, 
with a poem called Grave. And this poem is about someone in Seattle. It's written in first person. It's not about me. I don't write about myself. Um, so this is called Grave. What is stirring in my soul? My body drifting, unfastened with damage. Pain breaks, uncovers the powerful depths of water, carrying me soaked with explosion. I can't speak to the susceptible, to the inside, silent and buried defending my individuality. In daylight, I leave guessing. At night, I leave armored. At 2 a.m., I grant you falling stars, beacons of the forgotten. Encampment is an experience, a human condition. My hands, submerged in darkness, calculates my time left. Let me spell it out for you in vowels you don't understand. The earth isn't sustaining me, my organs which push out into space. Bones sing to the moon, a melody so clear, cold, it hurts of a secret. You know so little, the death of the mountains, the crisp humiliation of dead leaves, the clouds of a bad storm and rain speaking in punctuations, nuzzling me while I fold closed, the foliage disintegrating into a remembrance. You will forget me. Now abandoned, left alone in a cemetery, alone in the grass, in the soil, on vacation in a bottomless highway, lament like a meteor leaving a stone, broken in pieces like me. Thank you. Gloria Mindock, that was great, Gloria. Thanks so much. And we'll move uh, right along this evening. Uh, as the past brings us always to the present, our present uh, laureate is um, Lloyd Schwartz, Somerville's third and current laureate. Uh, Lloyd is the F Frederick S. Troy Professor of English at the University of Massachusetts, Boston. Um, he's a classical music critic for NPR's Fresh Air and a contributing arts critic for WBUR's The Artery. Among his awards are a Pulitzer Prize and three Deems Taylor Awards for his music reviews and fellowships in poetry from the National Endowment for the Arts and Guggenheim Foundation. And so anyone in poetry knows that music means so much and someone who understands music that, that well certainly brings a lot um, to poetry. The most recent of Lloyd's four poetry collections is Little Kisses, uh, was issued by the University of Chicago Press. The poems in the book have been described as humane, deeply moving, and curiously hopeful. Little Kisses is distinguished by its unsentimental but heartbreaking tenderness. Pitch Perfect Ear for Dialogue, Formal Surprises, and Exuberant Sense of Humor and that doesn't just sum up Little Kisses. I think it sums up uh, Lloyd's poetry and, and his poetic voice. Uh, he's done a lot in his young tenure as Poet Laureate already in Somerville. And one thing I want to mention is the first Saturday of every month at the West Branch Library. East, East Branch. Oh, that's East. I'm sorry. <laughs> the West Branch. Go to the West Branch. You won't even find it. It's all closed and torn down. Um, East Branch. Down on Broadway, the Gold Star Memorial Library, it's called. We, we do a, a, Lloyd conducts a discussion group on the big poems, the famous ones. Uh, so that's the, not tomorrow, but the day after tomorrow. If you go down there at 11, and if you want to prep for that, you can dig out your Yates and read Sailing to Byzantium. And also, they're going to talk about Keats and Ode to a Nightingale. And that should be wonderful. I was there last month. The, the table was full. The discussion was totally animated. It was a great time. Lloyd's poems have been selected for a Pushcart Prize, Poetry Daily, The Best American Poetry, three times, and The Best of the Best American Poetry. He's also an internationally recognized Elizabeth Bishop Scholar 
Among his bishop editions is the Library of America study, Bishop, Poems, Prose, and Letters. Um, everyone, please welcome our Poet Laureate, Lois Schwartz. Thank you. Thank you. I, one of the things I've um, most looked forward to was this event that at there was at some point the three of us could actually be reading uh, together and I'm, I'm so glad that this has happened and what a pleasure to hear you and then get a chance to read um, This is called A True Poem. I'm working on a poem that's so true, I can't show it to anyone. I could never show it to anyone because it says exactly what I think. And what I think scares me. Sometimes it pleases me. And this, usually, it brings misery. And this poem says exactly what I think. What I think of myself, what I think of my friends, what I think about my lover, exactly. Parts of it might please them. Some of it might scare them. Some of it might bring misery. And I don't want to hurt them. I don't want to hurt them. I don't want to hurt anybody. I want everyone to love me. Still, I keep working on it. Why? Why do I keep working on it? Nobody will ever see it. Nobody will ever see it. I keep working on it even though I can never show it to anybody. I keep working on it, even though someone might get hurt. Um, I came to Somerville in 1984 uh, to East Somerville. It's become a much more multicultural and interesting neighborhood than it used to be in 1984. And um, uh, I wanted to read a poem. I wanted to read a translation uh, of a poem uh, that's a famous poem in Brazil. It was so famous, it was actually, the, whole, the poem itself was actually printed on the Brazilian equivalent of the dollar bill. And, um, uh, and on the other side of the bill, there's a picture of the poet leaning over his desk writing the poem. And it's called Friendly Song. Uh, and the, Brazi the Brazilian poet, may maybe the greatest Brazilian poet of the 20th century, Carlos Drummond de Andrade. Uh, and this is Friendly Song. I'm working on a song in which my own mother sees her image. Everyone's mother sees her image, and it speaks. It speaks just like two eyes. I'm traveling along a roadway that winds through many countries. My old friends, if they don't see me, I see them. I see and salute them. I am giving away a secret like someone who loves or smiles. In the most natural way, two caresses reach each other. My whole life, all of our lives, make up a single diamond. I've learned a few new phrases and to make others better. I'm working on a song that wakes men up and lets children sleep. 
Um, um, uh, I had a birthday a few days ago. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's better than not having a birthday. <laughs> Um, and someone, you know, one of the interesting things about Facebook is you, you, you become friends with people who you don't know. And one of my Facebook friends, whom I don't know, posted this po poem of mine. And people were, were liking the poem. And um, I thought this was kind of... This was about, you know, one of the best birthday presents one, one could have. And one of the people who said she liked the poem was Gloria. So I thought I would read that tonight. Thank you for liking this. At least one person here will like this poem. <laughs> uh, it's called Nostalgia, The Lake at Night. The black water, lights dotting the entire perimeter, their shaky reflections, the dark tree line, the plap plapping of water around the pier, creaking boats, the creaking pier, voices in conversation, in discussion, Two men, adults, serious inflections, the words themselves just out of reach. A rusty screen door spring, then the door swinging shut. Footsteps on a porch, the scrape of a wooden chair. Footsteps shuffling through sand, Animated, youthful voices, how many, distinct, disappearing. A sudden guffaw, some giggles, a woman's, no, a young girl's sarcastic reply, someone's assertion, a high-pitched male cackle. Somewhere else? A child laughing. Bug zappers, tires whirring along a pavement, not stopping, receding. Shadows from passing headlights. A cat's eyes caught in the headlight. No moon. Connect the dot constellations filling the black sky. The ladle of the Big Dipper not quite directly overhead. The radio tower across the lake signaling. Muffled quacking near the shore. A frog belching. Crickets, cicadas, katydids, etc. Their relentless sexual messages. A sudden gust of wind. Branches brushing against each other, pine, beach. A fiberglass hull tapping against the dock. A sudden chill. The smell of smoke, wood stove fires. A light going out. A dog barking, then more barking from another part of the lake. A burst of quiet laughter. Someone in the distance calling someone too loud. Steps on a creaking porch. A screen door spring, the door banging shut. Another light going out. You must have dressed, you must have just undressed for bed my bare feet on the splintery pier, turning away from the water. Um, 
I've, I've written over, since I, you know, for years, I've written a lot of poems in the voices of other people, people who are not myself. Some of them were real, some of them were made up. And, um, and some of these poems, a few of these poems, were actually dialogues. And I'm going to read a couple of dialogues. And um, this is um, a poem um, from my first book that I'm, what, I'm, what I'm working on now is a um, collection of, a selection, a book that's a selection of, from, from all my other books and, and, and some new poems. And um, I think this is going to be the title poem of this, uh, of this new collection. It, it's called, I hope some of you recognize um, the, uh, the source of this title. It's called, Who's on First? <laughs> so it's, and you, you can just imagine that it's, it's, it's the same two people talking in each bit of dialogue. Who's on first? You can be so inconsiderate you are too sensitive. Then why don't you take my feelings into consideration? If you weren't so sensitive, it wouldn't matter. You seem to really care about me only when you want me to do something for you. You do too much for people. I thought you were going home because you were too tired to go with me to a bar. I was, but Norman didn't want to come here alone. I'm awfully tired. Do you mind taking the subway home? Silence. You could stay over. Silence. I'll take you home. Silence. Why do we have sex only when you want to? because you want to have sex all the time. Relationships work when two people equally desire to give to each other. Relationships rarely work. Do you love me? Of course, but I resent it. Why aren't you more affectionate? I am. Couldn't we ever speak to each other without irony? Sure. <laughs> I love you, you know. Yes, but why? Do you resent my advice? Yes, especially because you're usually right. Why do you like these paintings? What isn't there is more important than what is. Your, your taste sometimes seems strange to me. I'm a Philistine. A real Philistine would never admit it. I suppose you're right. Aren't you interested in what I care about? Yes, but not now. We should be more open with each other. Yes. Shall we talk things over? What is there to say? Are you ever going to cut down on your smoking? It's all right. I don't inhale. Sometimes I get very annoyed with you. The world is annoying. Your cynicism is too easy. Words interfere with the expression of complex realities. Do you enjoy suffering? You can't work if you don't suffer. But we suffer anyway. I know. Do you think we ever learn anything? I've learned to do without. You're always so negative. I feel death all the time. 
Are you afraid of anything? Not working. What shall we do for dinner? It doesn't matter. Whatever you'd like. Why don't you care more? I do. And this is another dialogue. And this is, um, and the, the, the characters in this, in this poem are uh, my mother and me. And uh, it's called, um, he tells his mother what he's working on. I'm writing a poem about you. You are? What's it about? It's the story about your childhood, the horses in the river. The ones that nearly drowned, I saved them. You told it to me just a few weeks ago. I should dig up more of my memories. I wish you would. Like when I lived on the farm and one of the girls fell down the well? Yes. I forget if it was Rose or Pauline. It was a deep well. I remember that story. Have you finished your poem? I'm still working on it. You mean you're correcting it with commas and semicolons? Exactly. When can I see it? As soon as it's finished. Is it an epic? It's not that long. No, I mean all my thoughts, the flashes of what's going through my life, the whole family history, living through the woe, the river and the water. I know. Will it be published? I have to finish it first. It's better to write about real life. That's more important than writing something fanciful. I try to write all my poems about real life. You see, the apple never falls far from the tree. I guess not. You're my apple. There's probably a worm crawling through that apple. Then it's got something sweet to chew on. Well, you're my tree. Yes, I'm your tree. You're an apple. I'm a tree. I'm going to read two more poems. And um, I've been, I, 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 I love paintings, art. Uh, and um, if I had to pick a favorite painter, it would probably be Vermeer. Um, I've been writing a bunch of poems recently about paintings that I really love. And this is a painting about um, maybe Vermeer's most famous painting, The Girl with the Pearl Earring. And um, a few years ago, it, the painting is in a museum in, uh, in The Hague in Holland. But a few years ago, it was on loan for a short time to a museum in New York to the Frick, at the Frick Collection. And um, I spent a lot of time looking at that painting. And this is the poem that sort of came from that experience. It's called Vermeer's Pearl. I used to boast that I never lived in a city without a Vermeer. You do now, a friend pointed out, when the one Vermeer in my city was stolen. It's still missing. The museum displays its empty frame. But there are eight Vermeers in New York, more than any other city, and not so far away. 
sometimes even more. Once, the visiting Vermeer was one of his most beloved paintings. It was even more beautiful than I remembered. A young girl wearing a turban of blue and yellow silk is just turning her face to watch you entering the room. She seems slightly distracted by someone a little off to your right, maybe someone she knows better than you. Her mouth is slightly open, as if she's just taken a breath and is about to speak. The light falling on her is reflected not only on her large pearl earring, but also in her large, shining eyes. Those are pearls, sings Ariel, of a man drowned in a tempest at sea that were his eyes. And on her moist lips, there's even a little spot of moisture in a corner of her mouth. Some art historians think this was not intended to be a portrait, just a study of a figure in an exotic costume. Yet her presence is so palpable, she seems right there in the room with you, radiating unique and individual life. Already in the museum is another Vermeer, in which a woman writing a letter has a similar pearl earring. She's interrupted by her maid handing her a letter. Is it from the person she's just been writing to? And in a nearby museum, there's a painting of a young woman with piercing eyes and another enormous pearl dangling from her ear, a teardrop pearl. She's staring out a window and tuning a lute. Scholars tell us these pearls aren't really pearls. No pearl so large has ever come to light. No oyster could be big enough. So the famous pearl is probably just glass painted to look like a pearl. Pearl of no price. Yet as you look, the illusion of the pearl, the painted pearl, glistening, radiant, fragile, but made real by the light it radiates, becomes before your eyes a metaphor for the girl wearing it. Or if not the girl, than Vermeer's painting of her. And I want to read one more poem. It's a Sestina, which is 39 lines. But this is the shortest Sestina. I think it's the shortest Sestina ever written. And um, uh, and it's also a dialogue. Six words. I, I just in, in case you don't know what a sestina is, it's a it's it's a poem in which the last word of every line is repeated in six following stanzas in a very specific order um, at, as, as the, the last word in, in, in each line. It's a kind of mathematical formula. So that's what's sort of behind this poem, the form of this poem. This is six words. Yes, no, maybe, sometimes, always, Never. Never? Yes. Always? No. Sometimes? Maybe. Maybe never sometimes. Yes. No always. Always maybe. 
No, never yes. Sometimes, sometimes always yes. Maybe never. No, no, sometimes. Never. Always? Maybe. Yes. Yes. No. Maybe. Sometimes. Always. Never. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, for coming this evening, friends and poets. And um, uh, and a thank you to the Somerville Public Library for the space. It's my library. I'm here almost every day. I love it. And if you're if you're not that intimate with it, you should come here more often because it's a really cool place to be. Other than that, I don't know. This is not a series. I don't have another event to announce. Does anyone uh, Saturday morning? If you want to go down to the East Branch Library and discuss sailing to Byzantium and Ode to a Nightingale with Lloyd, uh, the reading group will be down there. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Have a happy and safe holiday. <laughs>